Good morning. Before we begin, let us pray, shall we? Let's pray. Our Father God in heaven, we thank you that you have given us um, the ability to come back together. And as we hear the announcements from the government that we are moving out of phase two, that we rejoice because we can have fellowship with one another and we can gather physically with uh, the church and the members. And I know that, Lord, this is a privilege. This is indeed a blessing because many people, many churches around the world and even in Singapore, some churches could not still meet. And as we meet together today online and as we study your word, as you speak to us through your word, I pray, Father God, that our hearts be right and ready to receive your word. This we ask and pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm not sure whether you're into boxing. Uh, I'm not really into boxing because I got knocked out in the military. I was part of a team and my very first match, I was already knocked out in one punch. <laughs> But I do remember uh, boxing and the, the few greats, the Muhammad Ali, for example, Mike Tyson. And there's one particular guy that many of us don't know him. His name is called Joe Lewis, a.k.a. or otherwise known as Brown Bomber. I think that term given to him was a bit racist, but during that time, this is in America. And this boxer is famous because he ruled for over 12 years in the boxing ring under the heavyweight title. And between 1936 to 1948, he was the one who infamously said this, you can run, but you cannot hide. You can run, but you can't hide. And the reason why he said that was because there was a big match between him and another boxer, an up-and-coming boxer called Billy Korn. Now, Con, before he was fighting um, Joe Lewis, was asked this question, you know, what, what is your strategy? Because he's unbeaten. And, and Con was very confident. He said, that, I will just simply uh, hit and run, hit and run, leading to Lewis saying this, that you can run, but you can't hide. Lewis, of course, went on to knock out Con with two seconds left on the 13th round. In those days, they had many 15 rounds altogether. Now, sometimes we play hide and seek with God. We try to run away from God and only to be knocked out by His relentless pursuit of us. Today, we'll begin with a new series on the book of Jonah. And over the next four weeks, we'll be covering this uh, Old Testament prophetic book. And we will learn about this protesting prophet some 2,800 years ago. And I've entitled this series, The Relentless Pursuit of a Prodigal God. The Relentless Pursuit of a Prodigal God. And you may be asking yourselves, why prodigal? Why call God the prodigal God? It is because God chooses to pursue us and especially to pursue a protesting, a pouting, a problematic prophet who refuses to heed his call to go to a people to ask for repentance. And he is prodigal. God is prodigal because we can see throughout this whole book that even though his creation does not love him, he continues to pursue them relentlessly to ask them to return back to him. And God is slow to anger and abounding in grace and mercy and love. He is patient, which is why he's so prodigal in a sense. He's unconventional. He's not like the other gods of the ancient Near East. And that's why I entitled it The Relentless Pursuit of a Prodigal God. And even though we do not deserve God's love, God pursues us relentlessly because he is a prodigal God. Now, the book of Jonah is very popular among Sunday school students, kids, you know, especially love the story. And this 
really, this book was written some 2,800 years ago during the time of King uh, Jeroboam II, the king of Israel of the northern ten tribes, if you remember. And of course, you can reference that in 2 Kings chapter 14, verses 23 to 28. Now, King Jeroboam II was an evil king, but he reigned for a long time. And Jonah and Nahum and Amos all spoke uh, during that time. But what was unique was, like Nahum, Jonah spoke to the Gentiles. In fact, he was specifically called to go to Nineveh, an Assyrian uh, at the time, they are Assyrians, and this is the capital city of Assyria, Nineveh. So, and speak to these people, these Gentiles. And King Ashudan III was ruling at that time. And because he was preoccupied with his conquest, therefore King Jeroboam was able to extend the kingdom, especially in the northern kingdom, all the way up north to Syria. Now, the Lord God himself called Jonah to speak to this great Assyrian enemy of Israel to pronounce judgment against them. And Jonah, of course, attempted to escape that call and went the opposite direction. And in fact, he went towards a city that's called Tashish, which probably is in the western part of Mediterranean, uh, the Mediterranean Sea, which is in modern day Spain. I'll talk more about that later on. But in between that running away and then finally going back to Nineveh on land to, to speak to the Assyrians, we have a fantastic story of a great storm, a great fish, and of course, a great God who relentlessly pursues his creation, his people, to redeem people back to himself. Now turn with me now to Jonah. Jonah chapter 1, verses 1 to 16. And we want to ask ourselves this question. What will happen when we try to run and hide from God? What will happen to us? What are the consequences of not obeying God, not following His commandments? What will He do to us if we disobey Him and His orders? What will happen to us when we run away and hide from God? Now, there are three things, in fact, that are very clear in this passage, but I would like to share with you the progression of this uh, entire flow in the first 16 verses. We see an invitation uh, from God to redeem the Ninevites. We see a presumption from Jonah that uh, not doing the right thing is perhaps a right thing for him to do. And of course, we see an adjudication, that means the judgment, the running away from God leading to a judgment. And of course, we see a confession later on, especially by the sailors, the mariners, uh, leading to repentance. And finally, we see redemption itself. And I want to bring us to a New Testament, New Testament passage that mirrors very closely to what is happening in Jonah chapter 1. Now, the very first thing I want us to see is this, that God wants to redeem His creation and we are invited to be part of His plan. This is an invitation given to Jonah and this is the invitation that God continues to invite you and I to join Him in this great redemption plan. Let me read for you verse 1. And two, it says here, Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, the great city, and call out against it, for their evil has come up before me. We are immediately introduced to Jonah's story with a command from a holy God. Nineveh is about 550 miles or about 800 or 900 kilometers away from northern part of Israel. And of course, it is situated in modern-day Monsoon in Iraq. You go there via a land route, and you will take about, if you go by horse, fast horse, and you change your horses, about 10 days to reach there. So what do we know about Nineveh? 
and what do we know about God's care and concern for Nineveh? We know that firstly, Nineveh is the capital city. This is, everyone knows that because archaeology tells us that. You can find it in, in uh, ancient maps and all that. But what is interesting is the word that is being used to describe it. In verse 2, the first part of verse 2, it says, it is a great city. Now, you will find this word great in Hebrew is gadol, right? You find this word gadol, the root word appearing again and again. In fact, this entire book appears many times, and I'll talk more about that later on in the sermon series orientation uh, in, of Jonah after the service. However, we find that this is repeated again and again throughout this entire book. And in this chapter alone, six times, you know, in various forms, in English it's trans translated exceedingly great um, and things like that. However, what is in interesting is that it tells us that Nineveh is a very powerful a very powerful nation and it is on a conquest. And soon we know that they will also overtake the northern kingdom and Jeroboam and all, all the rest of these people will be taken away in captivity. And this, the third thing we know, not only just that it's a capital city, it's also a great city, but also the people are evil in God's sight. We read that in verse 2b. For their sins have come up, or their evil has come up before me. We know that these people are evil, their sins are plenty, and that they are powerful. And yet God called Jonah to go to this city to preach judgment against them so that they can repent. And notice the double imperative that God uses on Jonah. He says in verse 2, Arise, go to Nineveh. Arise, go. Two commands that are non-negotiable for them, for, for Jonah at least. God was very clear in his command. He wants Jonah to go to Nineveh to preach against his evil deeds. So he needs to come up, arise, literally get up. And that itself is a word play later on and I'll explain to you. And get up and go. And we know that God is inviting Jonah to participate with him, to show grace and mercy to a sinful group of people. One of the worst enemies, the worst feared enemies of Israel at that time. He wants to redeem his creation. God continues to do so even till today. God invites you and I to go to the world to be the light and, and the salt to a dark and tasteless world. He wants us to share the good news of Jesus Christ dying for our sins on the cross and that he rose again on the third day. God continues to invite you and I and even in Bethany itself, when we see how God opens up the possibilities for us to share our faith and our love and our concern for the people, whether is it through the gardening or whether is it through our activities with the nearby school, we know that it is God who invites us. It is not man's effort. And I do know that uh, a group of very faithful, very hardworking gardeners come, gardening team come twice a week just to make sure that we have a fruitful harvest recently. I know that. But at the end of the day, it is God who brings those neighbours to us. It's God who brings those chance opportunity for us to share the good news. God continues to want his creation to return back to him. God wants to return and redeem his creation. And we are invited to join his plans. He invited Jonah and he continues to invite us. But the question we have to ask ourselves is, what did Jonah do? How did Jonah respond, right? Did he go immediately? And this is where we turn to the very second point of today's story. And I would like to share with you that sometimes, sometimes we disobey God and think we are doing the right thing. Verse 3 and verse 5b. 
This is the presumption of Jonah, he's presumptuous. Verse 3 says, But Jonah rose and fled to Tashish from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tashish. So he paid the fare and went down into it to go with them to Tashish, away from the presence of the Lord. But, verse 5b, the second part, verse 5, but Jonah had gone down into the inner part of the ship and had lain down and was fast asleep. So we ask ourselves this question. God invited Jonah to go and preach repentance and forgiveness to these Ninevites. Did he do that immediately? He certainly acted immediately. It's just not the way we expect a prophet to behave. Notice the very first word in verse 3. It says, but. There's a huge contrast here. And the author of Jonah is telling us something is up there. Jonah, instead of going to Nineveh, he decided to go to Tashish. The author did not say, the author of uh, Jonah did not say this, but we know that Jonah is protesting. We know that he's running away. Twice in this verse itself, it says here that he's fleeing away from the presence of the Lord. Now, he's supposed to travel to Nineveh, right? Like I said, but you notice here very carefully, he went the opposite direction. If you can see from the map here, you will already know that Tashish is at least five times the distance via the sea to, to Tashish from Joppa, where he, he was, where he boarded. Uh, and compare that to going on land up to Nineveh. So what does it tell us about Jonah? What does it tell us about Jonah? First, you, we know that Jonah was running away from God, from the presence of God. Secondly, he's heading to ruin. Why do I say that? Why do I say that Jonah is heading towards ruin? Again, this book is beautiful. If those of you who love even English literature, for example, you can study this book in English and you find that there's fascinating word plays and ironies and twists and plot twists throughout this entire four chapters. And we know Jonah the author of Jonah is playing with words. Why do I say that? God says, arise, literally get up and go, right? In verse 3. That's a, verse 2, that was the command of God. However, notice here the, the play of words with the word down. Down, right? Notice the word, word play three times appears here. Down to Joppa, or modern day Jaffa in Israel today. Right? In verse 3b. And then he went down into the boat. And then later on, he went down again into the inner part of the ship in verse 5b. This is a wordplay to mirror the spiritual state of Jonah. Jonah is going downhill spiritually. He's going on a downward spiral on his journey with God. And contrast that with God asking him to go up towards Nineveh, Nineveh. And the worst part is this. Not only was he running away from God, he was heading towards ruin. The worst part is this. Jonah thinks he is right. And why do I say that? Because notice what he's doing. Once he went all the way down the spiritual lows, of himself running away from God, he was so comfortable lying at the bottom of a, of a ship and he was laid down and was fast asleep. You can't be fast asleep unless you think you are safe. You can't be fast asleep in the midst of a storm that's brewing unless you think you're doing the right thing. Sometimes we disobey God and think that we are doing the right thing. 
Don't miss this irony here. Jonah acted immediately, but he acted selfishly. We do not know why he disobeyed. Uh, at this point of time, perhaps he thinks God is crazy to want this evil Ninevites. Perhaps he thinks that they are beyond redemption. Perhaps he thinks, you know, they don't, he, he just don't like the way they, they wear their beard or their clothes. Maybe he's racist. I do not know. At this point of time, in chapter 1, we do not know. But later on in chapter 4, we find out his real answer. But that will have to wait until week four of this series. But we do know that he prefers to go on a cruise rather than a horseback riding. I really don't know why at this point of time, but I do know that he deliberately goes on the opposite direction. He deliberately disobeyed God and is clearly going downhill spiritually. When we are going against God, we are going downhill spiritually. And the best part is, he thinks he's right. He thinks he's okay. And he sleeps so soundly and comfortably, even when there are bad things happening to him. So now, the question is, what happened next? Right? What, what happened next? And this is where we move to the next scene and this sin changes rapidly in verses 4 to 9. Let me read for you. Verse 4. But the Lord hurled a great wind upon the sea, and there was a mighty tempest on the sea, so that the ship threatened to break up. The mariners were afraid, and each cried out to his God, and they hurled the cargo and was in the ship into hurled the cover that was in the ship into the sea to lighten them. When we run away from God's command, calamities will befall upon us and others. Calamity, bad things will happen to us and others. Remember what I said about the word gadol great. Here, the word is again repeated as you can see in verse 4. Twice it was repeated in verse 4. We know that this word was repeated again and again because now it describes a great wind and there's a great tempest that was brewing in the sea. God had brought judgment against Jonah. Adjudication. A judgment against Jonah. And why was that so? It's because Jonah was not fulfilling his call. While Jonah was so comfortable slipping away his irresponsibilities, calamities befell on those of the, on the same ship as him. But you may be asking, what calamities? Well, the ship is sinking. We know that the ship, the ship was threatening to break up. The sailors were scared. They were afraid. They, there was great fear in them in first 5a. And of course, they sacrificed their property. They were throwing away their cargo to lighten the boat. There are consequences. There are calamities that will befall on us when we do not do God's will in God's ways. And not only just affecting us, it affects others as well, when we disobey God, when we run away from God's commandments, calamities will befall upon us and others. This is the judgment of God, His punishment against those of us who disobey Him. But you may be asking this question, right? Why? Why is God punishing us, especially those innocent mariners, those innocent sailors? Can't he just simply send another prophet, right? He could have, okay, Jonah, maybe Jonah is hard of hearing, maybe, you know. Better still, you know, why don't you just send brimstone and fire against Nineveh? Isn't that easier? He has certainly done so in Sodom and Gomorrah. He could have done so also in Nineveh, right? Or he could have stricken these Ninevites with pestilence and disease and whatever, why? And this is where we turn to verse 7. Verse 7 says, And they said to one another, 
Come, let us cast lots that we may know on whose account this evil has come up upon us. So they cast lots and lots fell on Jonah. And then they said to him, tell us on whose account this evil has come up upon us. What is your occupation? And where do you come from? What is your country? And of what people are you? The sailors know that something terrible is happening, something wrong. Earlier, if you remember in verse 5, it says that they each cry out to God, right? And when their gods did not answer them, they start to cast lots. It was to no avail because they, they spoke to gods made out of their own hands. So they started casting lots to know, and it's repeated twice, to know on whose account this evil has come out on us. And we know that that lot came upon Jonah. Notice the irony here again, the word plays here again. In verse 2, what did God say about the Nineveh, the people of Ninevites, the Ninevites themselves? He said that they are evil, right? And the evil has come up to him in heaven. Now, what happened is that these mariners, these sailors, how did they describe or talk to Jonah? Now the evil has come down onto them because of Jonah's actions. They asked him, in fact, four very strange questions. They asked him, what is your occupation? Where are you from? What's your country? And what people are you? Now, imagine this for a while. It's storming. Your ship is about to break apart. You're throwing off all your cargo and possessions and you probably will suffer a huge economic loss, let alone your own physical life. In the midst of all this, would you ask that question or those questions? Now, if I'm the sailor, I'll be asking, what have you done wrong? The, the Lord is you. Are, you. are you the one who's, who's sinning against the gods or whatever? I would have asked that. But why? Why ask those strange questions? Now notice here very carefully. The question that was asked were all similar. They were questions about identity, about who Jonah is. And again, don't miss this irony here, this wordplay here. When we run away from God and His commands, calamities will befall upon us and others as well. And our identity, this is important, has responsibilities. Let me say that one more time. Our identity has responsibilities. Jonah was a prophet of Yahweh, the God of creation. He is supposed to be testifying for God, yet he failed to do so, and in fact, he chose to do it his own way. You can run, but you can't hide. And what happens later, what follows after this was so amazing because we see a testimony of Jonah and his self-indictment. He basically sabo himself, we call it in Singapore, right? He has offended the Creator God. Notice here what he says in uh, verse, notice what he says in verse 9. He says here in verse 9, I fear the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. He has indicted himself because he said that this is the God whom he serves. And this is God whom he serves who created the heavens and the earth. And especially now that they are in the sea, he even had to rub salt into the wound by saying that he is the creator of the sea and the land. Notice the humor there as well. And yet, do you notice that even though he said he fears this God, it wasn't a holy fear. He was fearful of God because he was irresponsible. He just simply didn't want to obey. If he truly, truly fears God, would he have run the opposite direction? Knowing that God can chase after him, that God will relentlessly pursue him. You can run, 
but you can't hide. And if he truly fears this God, why in the world is he disobeying him? When we run away from God's command, calamities will befall upon us and others. And so the question is, what will happen to all of them in this ship? What's, what's going to be the next scene? And this is where we move to the next scene in verses 10 to 16. Verses 10 to 16. Let me read for you verse 10 to 12. It says here, Then the men were exceedingly afraid and said to him, What is this that you have done? For the man knew he was fleeing from the presence of the Lord because he had told them. Verse 11. Then they said to him, What shall we do to you that the sea may be may quiet down for us? For the sea grew more and more tempestuous. And he said to them, Pick me up and hurl me into the sea. Then the sea will quiet down for you. For I know that, for I know it is because of me that this great tempest has come upon you. Our disobedience can sometimes be used by God to bring people to repentance. Our disobedience can sometimes be used by God to bring people to repentance. When Jonah finally reveals that he was fleeing from the presence of the Lord, the third time round, exceeding great gadol fear came to this man. Jonah asked them to show, throw him overboard so that the tempest will come down. He even recognized that it was because of him. He says here, because of me, that this great tempest has come upon you. He recognizes that problem, that it was his fault. It was not just because they cast lots and he fell on him. He knows that he's going against, willfully going against God. And what follows after this is nothing short of really amazing. And this is where we read verse 13 to 16. And it says here, Nevertheless, the men rode hard to get back to dry land, but they could not, for the sea grew more and more tempestuous against them. Therefore, they call out to the Lord, Lord, O oh Lord, let us not perish for this man's life and lay not on us innocent blood. For you, O oh Lord, have done as it pleased you. So they picked up Jonah and hurled him into the sea and the sea ceased from his raging. Verse 16, Then the man feared the Lord exceedingly gadol and they offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows the sailors were more honorable than Jonah did they immediately throw Jonah out? if I'm the sailor I mean, if I'm the captain yeah, I just throw him out aboard and out inside everything will be settled but he did not do so the sailor tried to even rescue him they still try to preserve life. Here, Jonah don't even care if the entire nation of Assyria, the capital city, is being destroyed by God. And here, his one puny little life was being preserved and protected by Gentiles, sailors, people who are not Jews, who are not Israelites. The sailors did not immediately throw him out. They were more honourable than him. I would have done so, but not them. But when that failed, they cried out to the Lord. Notice that they cried out. Now they are no longer crying out to their gods, if you remember earlier. Now they're crying out to Yahweh. Jonah's disobedience led the sailors to repentance. Sometimes our disobedience can be used by God to bring people to repentance. Isn't that a twist? Isn't that an irony by itself? The sailors did three very amazing things. I don't want you to miss out these three very important things, which is why I said that they were repentant. First, it says here in verse 16a that they feared the Lord exceedingly. Great fear, gadol. 
Second, they offered a sacrifice to the Lord in verse 16b. And third, they made vows. Now, in ancient times, people don't make vows easily, and if they make vows to their God, they have to do so, or calamities will befall on them. And now they are making vows in the midst of a storm when they witness what's happening. So all the more they will be genuinely fearful of this God. They turn to the God of Jonah, even as Jonah turned away from God. Our disobedience can sometimes bring people to repentance and be used by God. So what will happen after they throw Jonah overboard? Well, for that answer, you will have to wait for Pastor Paul's sermon next week, which will be streamed online for us here, even though you come here physically. But I don't want us to miss a few important facts that God is still sovereign. God still carries out his purposes. And if you think about it, if you pause for just a while, does this story of Jonah, of the storm, people being afraid, Jonah sleeping, and then, then later on, the people were blaming Jonah, does it remind you of another story in the Bible? If you have your Bibles with you, turn with me to the Gospel of Mark. Mark chapter 4. Mark chapter 4, verses 35 to 41. Let me read for you Mark chapter 4, verses 35 to 41. It says here, On that day, when evening had come, he, referring to Jesus, said to them, Let us go across to the other side. And leaving the crowd, they took him with them in the boat, just as he was. And the other boats were with him. And a great windstorm arose, and the waves were breaking into the boat, so that the boat was already filling. But he was in the stern, asleep in the cushion, on the cushion. And they awoke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? And he awoke and rebuked the wind and said to the wind, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. He said to them, Why are you so afraid? Have you still no faith? And they were filled with great fear and said to one another, Who then is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? Do you see the similarities of this story about Jesus written some 800 years later? with the story of Jonah. Now, if you cannot see this, let me show you through this chart the comparison between Jesus and Jonah. Right? You see that in Jonah chapter 1, verses 3 to 16, and in, in Gospel of Mark chapter 4, verses 35 to 41. Both of them travel by boat to a Gentile region. Both of them experienced great storm and the boat was sinking. Right? And great fear came upon the people because of the drowning threat. And of course, Jonah was asleep soundly inside the boat. Jesus was soundly asleep inside the boat in the stern. The stern is underneath itself of the boat. The protagonist blamed, or that means Jonah was blamed for his inaction because he couldn't care less. Jesus was also blamed by his disciples for his inaction. And of course, Jonah took action and he took certain action <laughs> and the storm ceased and Jesus took action and the storm ceased. And of course, as a result of that, fear and wonder came upon the sailors and fear and wonder came upon Jesus' followers, his disciples. You see the similarities? But what's the difference? There's a huge difference. Jonah sailed for Tashish to avoid God's call to save the Ninevites Gentiles. Remember that. Jesus sailed 
to the other side. He was in Sea of Galilee. He was actually on the western part. He's sailing towards the eastern part, towards Jordan. And he was sailing towards an area where the Gentiles are to be obedient to God's call. Jonah never quite, never calmed the sea, the storm. Jesus did. And he quiets the storms, showing that, remember the question was asked towards the end, who then is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? Well, in the very first verse of Mark's gospel, what did Mark say? The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Jesus is God. That's why he could come to see. Now the thing is this, what are the lessons we can learn from Jonah, from this whole entire story? I know it's a Sunday school story, many of us are familiar with it, but what can we learn from this story? A few things I want to leave with you as you go back and meditate on this. The first thing is this, God is not over with anyone and we shouldn't too. God is not over with the Ninevites and he's certainly not over with Jonah, even though he was a protesting, a prodigal, a problematic, a pouting. Later on, you see that he pouts a lot. He complains a lot. But God is never over with him and neither should we. If you have someone who is a sore thumb for you, a pain in wherever you are to you. Remember, this person is probably also a person that's loved by God. Not probably, is loved by God. And no matter how difficult that person may be, God is not over with that person and neither should we. Second, God's word and commands has to be obeyed. There are consequences if we don't do so. And those consequences not just hit us, it will also infect, I shouldn't be using the word here in a pandemic, but it will infect those around us as well. There are consequences of our disobedience. Third, God's people has a responsibility. Our identity has responsibilities. We call ourselves Christ followers many little Christians, Christ followers. That's what Christian means. So therefore, if we are Christ followers, we have responsibilities. And that responsibility is to bring people to God himself through Jesus Christ. Notice we don't save them. Jesus saves them. Not us. But our responsibility is to bring them to him. That's why it is not an option for us not to invite our friends and to share with them, our families, to share with them the love of Christ. It is not an option for us if we are Christians. And the church has a lot of activities giving you ample opportunities, gardening, soon to be Mooncake Festival, or uh, Mid-Autumn Festival, soon to be even the, the reading program in nearby school. And of course, there are many other things. Will you be responsible if we call ourselves Christians? And finally, God's solution is Jesus Christ. Only Jesus can save us from the storms of life. The sailors were rescued from the storm. But Jesus rescues us in the storm. I'm not sure what you're running away from, if you are running, indeed running away from, but remember this, you can run. But because God relentlessly pursues you, because he's a prodigal God, he's a God who's slow to anger and bounding grace, you can run, but you cannot hide from God's love. Jesus wants to save you and I from our storms. Will you obey and run back to him? Let us pray. Father God, we thank you that Jonah, in spite of all that he has done, in spite of the fact that he 
tries to do things his way and goes the opposite way. Yet God, your God who relentlessly pursues him until he obeys. Many of us are like Jonah. And there's a Jonah in all of us, oh Lord. Sometimes we disobey and we think we are right. And yet the invitation is always there to partner with you, to bring more to a saving knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Help us to fulfill our identity by being responsible. Otherwise, Father God, even if we run away from you, we can't hide from you because you are the creator God who made the heavens and the earth, the sea and the land. And there are consequences of our disobedience. Forgive us, Father God, if we have not done so and help us to live our lives holy and pleasing to you. This we ask and pray in Jesus' name. Amen.